Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our first in our series of webinars on mental health and well being. Tonight, we're bringing to you Dr. Yona Lunsky, who's going to speak on a family focus lessons learned during COVID 19. But first of all, I would like to acknowledge that that we're meeting virtually, although we're meeting virtually, we're all on land that has been inhabited by indigenous people for thousands of years. I speak to you from Collingwood, Ontario, and it's important to know that the land that I live, work and play on is traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people, which include the Odawa, the Ojibwe as well. Um, we acknowledge that, that uh, these folks cared for their families and they cared for their communities the way we now seek to care for ours. And we continue to seek to do better, to continue to recognize and learn and grow in friendship and community, nation to nation. I'm going to let Dr. Lenski Yona introduce herself tonight. Um, she comes to us from um, uh, CAMH in Toronto and I'm just a little bit of housekeeping before I pass it over to Yona. I would ask that everybody keeps their mic muted during Yona's presentation. And also, we'll ask you to turn your cameras off uh, when Yona starts to speak, and we will open them up again at the end of her um, at the end of her presentation. Any comments can be written into the chat um, if you've got a question. Um, or you have something that you'd like to address immediately, we can certainly take care of that now or in an hour from now. And um, thank you again for joining us this Canadian Down Syndrome Week. And I look very forward to listening to you. Yona, over to you, Dr. Lunsky. Thanks so much, Laura. And uh, it's nice to, to have an evening for those of you where it's evening. Um, to just uh, talk for an hour. Um, I tried to pull some different ideas together that I hope will um, be helpful to you. Uh, and even if there's just one or two things maybe that I say tonight that connect for you or make sense to you, then um, I've done a good job. And um, it's a, when I put up my slides, I'm gonna pull them up now actually, um, I may not see the chat box. So I'm gonna let you know if that happens because that just means that I won't see your comments as they come in. I will be able to um, monitor, I'll be able to monitor that for you and, uh, and let you know. Okay, I think actually I'm able to move it over here. Okay. Just in case, I'm just going to check. I'm going to start my slides. So do you see my screen? Do you see from the beginning, the first slide? I yeah. see. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. So yeah, I come from CAMH and um, I direct a center there um, focused on um, developmental disabilities like Down syndrome and other disabilities. And I'm really interested in how we can Sorry. help um, young yeah. I'm just going to interrupt you a little bit, Yona. We can see your next slide and your notes, so it's not you the full screen. Yeah. It's not the okay, full screen on. version. Display settings, sure. um, swap presenter view and slideshow. What do you see now? That's the full screen. Yes. Perfect. All right. I don't want to get. I don't want you to see my things. I'm going to say later because that'll give away my surprises. Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah. So I'll talk, and I promise to save some time at the end some conversation and certainly I can see the chat box if you have a question or a thought you're welcome to um, put that into the chat box and I'll see it while we talk so um, I just put together a couple of photos um, of different families because we're talking about down syndrome and families and these are families all of which I found on the internet because of the important sort of news stories that they spoke about over this last uh, year and a bit around on the pandemic and they're also families that I am lucky enough to know. Um, so I consider these people friends or colleagues and they've taught me really important things about what's happening for people with Down syndrome during the pandemic. So Anna and Doolin at the bottom. Um, uh, Doolin was involved in a um, class that we were teaching other adults who have disabilities about COVID and mental health. Um, and Anna and Doolin also spoke to the media in Ottawa about 
um, vaccinations and why they were so important for people with Down syndrome. And Helen and Paul, who I think are uh, on the call from Ottawa, are wearing the masks. And uh, they were in a really nice article, a couple of stories actually over the pandemic, but there was a nice article about them that Inclusion Canada wrote when they talked about families. Um, and Helen, like me, is a sister of someone who has a disability, Paul. And uh, as sisters, Helen and I talk a lot about different things. And then up near the top, you see two guys with their arm muscles and they're practicing, that's Rob and his brother Lou, and they're practicing to get the vaccine because Lou was a bit scared of getting the vaccine when it was going to be his turn. And Rob wanted to make sure it went really well. And I work with Rob. In fact, some of the research I talk about today is work I've done with Rob. And then Mike and Aaron uh, are in that photo there. The only person missing from that photo is Sue. Um, and they're involved in the Ready for My Shot campaign. And Aaron has been a really, um, really vocal sort of advocate um, around the importance of um, the health of people who have Down syndrome and also the importance of getting vaccinated and feeling safe out in BC. So I just wanted to sort of highlight that these are kind of my ideas, but they're very influenced by just the conversations that I've been able to have with people who, um, you know, really think very deeply about all these things. And I'm really grateful to be able to learn from them. Okay, so these are a bunch of numbers and some of you might really like numbers and statistics and some of you might be like really not interested at all so I won't spend too much time on it but what I wanted to highlight in this slide is that even before COVID happened um, we knew that people with Down syndrome and other disabilities um, you know had a much harder time in the healthcare system so this slide is showing us that um, for these adults going to the emergency department and then like having another problem and coming back within the same month is more likely being in the hospital and then you're discharged, so you're sent home from hospital. They are more than three times likely to come back to the hospital that month. They're also more likely, sadly, to be stuck in the hospital. So it means they get their treatment in the hospital, they're in an inpatient bed, they really want to go home, but they can't go home because their home isn't still for a long time. And then the last two squares are talking about living in long-term care. And some of us will move into long-term care. We might know people who live in long-term care. But this is looking at people who are young living in long-term care. And we know that if you have Down syndrome or other disabilities, that's more likely to happen to you. And finally, and I'll talk a bit more about this, uh, although it's hard to hear, is that people are more likely to die at a younger age um, if they have a developmental disability, particularly if they have Down syndrome. So, and there's lots of reasons for these things, but I don't think it's just about, you know, something in the chromosomes that makes these things happen. I think it's about um, maybe the little bit of stuff that might go wrong because of um, having Down syndrome. So some health problems are more likely, but it's really also about how our system responds and supports people when they have a health problem, if they have Down syndrome and things we need to do better. So we did this study and I, I wish, first of all, and I'm going to talk about bad news because I'm going to have a little bit of bad news in this presentation, but I'm going to try not to have too much. We did this study and we published it in the summer. And I wish we could have published it sooner because as many of you will remember, you know, people have been talking about how things are harder if you have Down syndrome during COVID for a long time, but there wasn't a lot of movement in Canada to make things better for people with Down syndrome because they said they don't have the numbers, they don't have the data. So in this study, we actually looked at what was happening for people with Down syndrome. Um, and we found that if we compared them, these are all the adults with Down syndrome in Ontario, if we compared them to the people who didn't have Down syndrome and um, as well as other developmental disabilities, we found that people with developmental disabilities like Down syndrome were more likely to get COVID, more likely to be hospitalized if they got COVID and more likely to die if they got COVID. And so people with Down syndrome, it says at the bottom, were 6.6 .6 times more likely to die if they got COVID. And in this slide here, I'm showing some bar graphs and the dark purple bars are people with Down syndrome and the light purple bars, which are shorter, are people without Down syndrome. And what you see is the likelihood of getting hospitalized is much bigger if you have Down syndrome, if you get COVID, and the same as the likelihood of dying. Now, not everybody who gets COVID with Down syndrome gets very sick, gets hospitalized or dies. And that's a really important thing to remember. In fact, most people who got COVID did okay. It's just that it is more likely if you have down syndrome that these things can happen to you, which is why um, getting vaccinated and now as people are thinking about it, getting a booster 
is really important. And also why it's so important for everybody else in our community to take care of themselves and follow the rules so we don't have as much COVID where we live. I picked this article. Um, it was a story, a news story that was in CBC last, last spring uh, here in Ontario, again in Ottawa. And I picked it because this sort of thing, knowing that people with Down syndrome are at greater risk was so important, but people in government were thinking about it as much as they should have and as quickly as they should have. And um, poor Tula in this picture, she was doing well, but she did get sick from COVID and her family had worked so hard to try to get her vaccinated before she got COVID. But she got COVID when she was in the hospital and it was really hard for her. She's not on the ventilator anymore, uh, but this was a really hard time for her and her family. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit, I talked about COVID and obviously COVID is really bad, but other things happen to people because of COVID in the last 18 months. So I just wanna remind you of what we know about in terms of how people with Down syndrome and other developmental disabilities have managed over the course of the pandemic. So in this picture, I'm showing three examples of studies that have been done. The first one is from uh, Ireland and they're looking at people above the age of 40 and they, they asked them questions about how they were managing before COVID and then they asked them how they're doing once COVID started. And they also just asked them this summer how they're doing a year and a half almost later. The other study I wanna mention is a really big study in the UK where they interviewed about 600 adults who have developmental disabilities about what was happening to them, uh, including many people with Down syndrome. And they also spoke to many families to find out what that experience was like. And then we did a study here um, looking at the experience of adults with developmental disabilities in Ontario. So what did we learn about all these individuals in terms of how they're doing during COVID? And you can tell me if this is kind of like your experience. Um, so people who have Down syndrome and other disabilities is really hard in terms of feeling more lonely or isolated, more anxious about things and just feeling kind of down or sad or depressed. Also, you know, especially when people were kind of stuck in their homes and couldn't go anywhere. It's really hard when people didn't get along with the people they were living with, or sometimes they got along with them, but sometimes they didn't and they didn't really have anywhere else to go, especially if you lived in a smaller place. Getting healthcare was really hard for people and getting supports that people needed in person was almost impossible sometimes. One thing that's really important if you have Down syndrome is that you need to see your doctor once a year to have what's called a health check, because you wanna make sure that your health is doing okay and that if there's a small healthcare problem that we start to deal with it quickly before it becomes a big problem. But a lot of people haven't been able to see their doctors and have those kinds of health checks. And also people who've needed mental health support. So people who are having a problem with very serious anxiety or depression, were not able to see a counselor or see someone to help them with their mental health support, which is really, really hard. Two good things we've learned about, and we've read about this here in Canada, but also in other parts of the world, is that some people, and I'd love to know uh, if you're listening to this and you have Down syndrome, some people have really liked using technology and have learned to do new things on technology they never did before. So learning to use Zoom, um, learning to look up things and watch things that are interesting, learning to do activities on an iPad or a computer, uh, and connecting with people that they maybe wouldn't connect with otherwise. Uh, and also for some people, having less stuff to do, like for some people having less stuff to do has been really hard. For some people, maybe they were doing a lot of things and not all the things were easy to do. So some people have found that having less activity um, is a bit less stressful for them. Bottom line, I think, is that it, it was certainly hard for everybody, but some people it was harder than for other people. And, and at the same time, I just wanna say that as we're moving and restrictions are lessening and things are getting easier and some people are going back to work and some people are going back to their activities they used to do, that is easy and good news for a lot of people. But for some people, that kind of change is still a change and it's hard, it can be stressful. So what do we know about family caregivers? So this is now looking not so much at people who have Down syndrome, but at their parents or their brothers or their sisters. I just wanted to emphasize two projects here. One is that really big project I mentioned in the UK where they um, got surveys from several hundred families. We also did some work here uh, in Canada looking at what was happening to adult siblings. Because of course there are brothers and sisters who have Down syndrome and brothers and sisters who don't have Down syndrome. And so we've been studying or following um, brothers and sisters um, since, since the pandemic began. Uh, so what are we learning about families and how families are managing right now? Um, first of all, one thing that's really important is how families were managing at the 
beginning of the pandemic and how everybody's managing now. Two totally different things, right? Now, some of the reasons that started and we need to look more at what's happening now. But what we are seeing is that some people are very tired. Uh, and supports aren't necessarily in place. So this is a survey that people answered um, in the UK this last summer. Good news in the UK, but we saw feeling very stressed. A lot of people, over half the people talked about sleep. That's really not sort of good sleep. Um, and then uh, some people talking about being depressed or irritable, having time to doctor and developing their own health problems. So I just want to mention this because I think, and we all know this, you know, if somebody in my family is having a hard time, that's hard for me too. So whether, you know, it's your mom or your dad who's having a hard time or your brother or your sister, um, you know, or your son or your daughter, um, as family, what happens to one person's mental health affects all of us. So the question is, what do we do about this? I'm just grabbing my telephone because I'm not gonna call anyone, but I realize that I always need to keep track of the time so I don't speak for too long on anything. So, so far I'm doing okay. Um, what I wanna do for the, for the more interesting part of the talk, you know, I can't see any of your faces. Hopefully the first part of the talk was interesting enough, but instead of me telling you what we know from the research, I really wanna talk about a few suggestions of things that we can do. And I'm showing in this sort of diagram here that there are different people's perspectives and everybody can make a difference in terms of helping people manage during COVID to be safe, to be healthy, uh, and to be happy. So families can do stuff. People who have Down syndrome can do stuff. And also healthcare providers, case managers, workers, they also play a role. We can all do things to help. So I'm going to go over basically five lessons, okay? So my first lesson is that I think it's really important to know where you're at. So I talked about how some people are having a hard time emotionally um, or a hard time physically, you know, that change is difficult. If you don't know how you're doing, it's really hard for you to ask for help from other people or to do things differently. So first I'm gonna show you an example. This is for caregivers. This would be if you're, if you don't have Down syndrome yourself, but if you're a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister, I think it's helpful for you to ask these questions, okay? So this is a family distress scale. It's really, it's just coming up with a number from one to 10 of how you're doing today um, and how stressful things are for your family. And I think it's really important to be able to sort of put this somewhere, take a look at it and see where you're at because the number changes. You know, you might have a couple of days in a row where you're feeling like a four or a five. And then things kind of go to a six or a seven. And we really start to worry when it's getting a bit higher, you know, higher than a six. Um, and that's when people really need to ask for help. But sometimes to explain what the problem is, it can be easier to kind of just say, we won't be able to handle things soon. If one more things goes wrong, we'll be in crisis. That's how serious it is. I'm a seven. So being able to recognize that about yourself and being able to communicate that to somebody else is a really important skill. Okay, so this is just an example of something that you can use yourself to talk about how your family is doing. Uh, and it's important to know that, you know, some families in the exact same situation, one family is going to say I'm a three and another family is going to say I'm a seven or two people in the same family can give very different numbers for the same situation because we all kind of manage um, differently. But certainly if you notice that you're doing um, like you got a greater number, a six, a seven and an eight. And it's not going down. It's not just like a bad morning and things get better. It's really when you need to reach out to other people. But there's another idea I want to talk about here. And it's called understanding kind of what is sort of typical or normal for you. Uh, and then another way to talk about it is understanding your strong mind. So these are two different examples of programs. I realized I forgot to put in the link for understanding my strong mind. So I'm going to add that in after. And I can always share um, a version of these slides, Laura, if people want to see them after. But both of these programs, Understanding My Strong Mind is an adaptation that uh, we worked on at CAMH uh, together with folks uh, from Special Olympics Canada. So we worked with some athletes in Special Olympics and some coaches. And it's sort of based on ideas that came from Know Your Normal, which is the first picture that says everyone's normal is different. 
And the idea here is pretty simple. What it says is that we have to know, and this is like, if you have Down syndrome, if you don't have Down syndrome, we all have to know what it means for us on a regular day, how we're doing. So then we can tell when things are different. Okay, so here it says everyone's normal is different. And so everyone's kind of typical, this is how I am, is different. So one person might be really quiet, usually they're kind of shy, you know, they don't have, they're not very energetic, but they're very happy to do things on their own. And then when things are worse for them, they're really kind of agitated. They're walking around, they're pacing, they're speaking in a louder voice, um, they're less patient, right? Somebody else, their sort of normal every day is very friendly, very loud, very outgoing, very quick, always interrupting people, just kind of ready to go to the next thing. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, maybe very emotional, but that's their every day, right? And then when something changes for them, they get a little bit quieter. And maybe that's kind of easy. And you say, well, that's good. They're quiet now. That's great. Well, it's not great that they're quiet because actually they're not a quiet person, right? So we have to understand what somebody's like before to highlight that things are different now. So understanding your own strong mind, what your mind is like when things are regular um, versus what your mind might be like when things are different or understanding what your normal is like and understanding when you're not at your normal. That's really good information for all of us to know about for ourselves and to explain to other people. Lesson number two is that I think we all need help to recognize and unpack emerging mental health issues. So I'm a mental health expert. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this means, but I'm gonna teach you an acronym today called HELP. Let me know if you've heard of HELP before. You can put it in the chat box. So this is what HELP stands for. It stands for Health, Environment, Lived Experience, and Psychiatric Difficulties. And the idea here, and again, I can include these links after, is there's a version of this that you can read about if you have a disability, if you're a family caregiver, or if you're um, a service provider who works in the community with people with disabilities. Um, but really, everyone's learning the same idea here, the same principle about the word help. So the first part of help is if something's wrong, if someone's having a hard time, before we try to figure out, is this anxiety, is this depression? What medication should we give? Should we get therapy? Stop. First thing we have to do is check to make sure that all that physical health stuff we've looked at and we've dealt with. So here you see that she's sort of holding her stomach, right? And so the thing is, she might be having something wrong with some pain. Maybe she's constipated. Or maybe she has diarrhea. Or maybe she's just kind of feeling a bit nauseous or something. We have to treat that and understand what's going on with that health issue before we can start to deal with other issues. So this is just a bit of a handout um, that, that um, people might read to remind them of what some of these things are. So you need to take care of your body and notice if something is hurting. You have to tell someone if you're not feeling well, and you have to tell them if you're having some pain. And it's reminding us about things like making sure, especially during COVID, don't forget about getting your eyes checked and your ears checked, as well as your teeth. Pain in the teeth can be very serious and cause a lot of problems for people. Knowing about your patterns in the bathroom, knowing that you're regular and everything you're doing in the toilet is the regular stuff you're supposed to be doing, knowing that your medicines you're taking properly every day, that your sleep is going well, and knowing if you have a headache or you're feeling weak. So it's really important to figure out what those H issues are before we start dealing with the other stuff. And these are just some examples of different kinds of tools you can use to help collect information about health issues. It would be really helpful to sort of share if you're seeing um, a doctor about what kinds of things might be causing pain. Um, and then the second picture here is actually showing what it looks like, what your stool or your poop um, looks like when you go to the bathroom in terms of what is more healthy and what is less healthy. So you can explain that to a doctor. I put this up here. Um, uh, sorry if anyone's eating dinner. I put it up here because it's really important. We don't talk about it a lot. Um, but if you have Down syndrome, you could have a lot of issues sometimes with going to the bathroom. And it might feel embarrassing. You might not want to tell other people about it. But if we don't recognize that that stuff is going on, you can get very, very sick. You can have a lot of pain. And it can even be something that leads you to have to go to the hospital. So now I'm going to talk about the letter E, the environment. And here you see this man's got his, um, his, his hands over his ears because whatever's going on in that environment is just too stressful for him. And somebody's offering him, do you want to wear some noise canceling headphones to make the stimulation a little bit less, um, to sort of make you feel less stressed out. So again, we don't want to give this guy a medication to calm him down. 
when actually what's going on is the environment is too stressful. So what we need to do in this situation is change the environment and make it easier for him to manage and give him more support. So here's some questions you could ask about, are you feeling safe and comfortable in your home? You wanna have a place where you can relax and feel good. So it's just showing different kinds of environments that are more crowded, that are maybe some people like being out in nature, some people might find that stressful, things might be too loud, you might be able to get exercise, you might not. Now I'm gonna talk about the letter L, and L stands for lived experience. And here you can see um, that uh, they're trying to explain something that happened to them, their story, something that happened that was really stressful or traumatic to them, and they're telling a doctor about it. Um, and you know, when we think about COVID, there are a lot of things that have happened in the last 16 months, a lot of lived experiences that people have had that are really stressful and difficult. And so it's really important for us, I think, um, to think about those kinds of experiences, especially if maybe, you know, it might be hard for you to talk about those experiences yourself, or if there's somebody with a disability in your family, it might be really hard for them to talk their, their experience, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't a hard experience. So losing people because they've been sick, because they've died, because we haven't been able to see them, um, having a really important routine that makes a big difference to you, and that routine kind of falling apart. And I know tomorrow evening, there's gonna be a talk about um, the importance of kind of your groove and what happens when that routine or that structure isn't in place for you and what that's like. So those kinds of losses uh, are really stressful for people. And again, you know, do we treat that with a medication? Maybe, but I think understanding and just giving space to recognize how difficult that experience is is also a kind of treatment that we really need to consider first before we start saying that someone has a psychiatric issue. We need to understand how things impact people and make safe spaces to be able to talk about it. And also let everybody know that like, you know, that does feel hard, that does feel scary, that does make me angry. I can see why you're feeling that way. So giving people um, space and kind of validating that sometimes what they're feeling isn't great and that a lot of people are not feeling great right now and that it's okay not to feel happy. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel sad or disappointed uh, and being able to sort of have that kind of emotional experience and know that other people go through that as well can, um, can really make a difference for people. So here's um, just an example of the different kinds of stories or difficulties that people have had and knowing about those kinds of things and being able to talk about them can actually start to change how we feel about those experiences. And then the P in HELP stands for psychiatric disorder. So the idea here, and you can see this woman is sort of tearful and someone's helping her out and handing her a tissue. You know, just like people who don't have Down syndrome, people with Down syndrome can have all sorts of mental health or psychiatric issues. And it's important that they be able to get the help they need just like everybody else. Um, so we wanna make sure if someone's little bit of nervousness or a little bit of sadness turns into a lot of sadness, a lot of depression where they can't get out of bed and they don't wanna do anything and don't, don't enjoy the things they used to do, or they're so anxious that they're afraid to leave their home. You know, if people are having those kinds of difficulties or if somebody is hearing some voices in their head and the voices are telling them things and it's making them really upset and they're feeling angry, those are the kinds of things that people need to get help for. And we need to have ways to explain that. If you have a disability, if you don't have a disability, and we need to make sure people get the help they need for that. But we don't wanna start treating those kinds of issues until first we've thought about the H, the E, and the L, the other stuff that I spoke about. So I hope that's helpful, helpful to you that I talked about help, and I hope you can remember that. And then you can look at some of the resources that explain some of the things I spoke about. So here's just a little bit of a reminder about how important your mental health is. And um, it's something that you feel, and there's different ways you can deal with your mental health. Okay, so now I'm gonna to talk to you about my third lesson. And this lesson is that there are different skills that we can have to help us understand how to get mental health services and also how to promote mental health during COVID. And also as we're trying to get through COVID, I'm just gonna share a couple of those resources with you now. So these booklets, again, I'm not seeing anything in the chat box and I'm assuming that's because nobody has put anything in the chat box. I'm hoping you're all still at this meeting with me. Um, but I don't know if anyone has seen these COVID self-help books that I've put these pictures of on the screen, but they're really useful. Um, and they came from our colleagues at the University of Glasgow. And then we kind of tried to edit them and make them a little more Canadian. Um, and they're in English and they're in French. 
and they're really helpful booklets that people can read through together. So you might read, you might not be a good reader, but there's really good pictures in the books as well. And these are things to look at, to think about what to do if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling down, a way to sort of solve your problems, to keep yourself busy and also work on your sleep. So um, I would recommend people look at these booklets. They're not just about COVID, they're actually booklets that were developed before COVID, but they sort of have a bit of, they have stories and stuff for people um, having these kinds of feelings during COVID and suggestions about how people can cope with them. I also think there's a really helpful um, series of books called Books Beyond Words, and I don't know if anyone's heard of those, but uh, Books Beyond Word are, um, are really, um, they're, they're books that just have drawings. They're beautiful um, illustrations, actually, but no words at all. Because some people, I think, maybe can't read or don't like words, but that doesn't mean they don't like to see pictures or drawings to think about how they're feeling. So there's a new Books Beyond Words that was created to help people with vaccination and what happens after vaccination. There's Books Beyond Words to look at if somebody you love is really sick or dies. There's Books Beyond Words to help you if you have to go to court. There's Books Beyond Words to help you have a mammogram uh, or a physical exam. So there's how to deal with being angry. So nice to hear that uh, those are useful to you, Helen, uh, Stefan, and Paul. Um, but it's another really helpful resource, I think, during the pandemic. And um, there's also an app that you can use now that's free, or you can pay a bit of money to have more of the pictures. But if you don't want the actual books, you can just sort of go on the app and look up some of the pictures and drawings and stuff. I will say, though, we actually, in a project that we were involved in um, earlier this year, we told the families they could order. And all these books you can sort of access online or whatever on your own. But we mailed them to... Um, uh, people with development disabilities who took a course with us. So everyone had their own copy of these books, not the books beyond words, but the books on the screen here. And uh, people really liked having that. Uh, and I, I guess I'm a big fan. I don't know here who likes to have books as opposed to using things online, but it's really helpful sometimes to be able to hold a book in your hand to remember, this is my book. This book tells me how to do things when I'm having a hard time. This is the book I talked about with other people. And you go back and you look at the book and you see the notes that you took in the book. You remember the reminders about the book. People really liked in the group that we did having their own book and being able to go back to it. So um, also remember, like, if everything's online, sometimes it's really hard to find stuff. Uh, you might look at it once, you never look at it again, and you never remember that you have it. So I'm a big fan, if you can, of printing things or having books, um, putting it on a shelf and knowing you can pull it up again when you need it. That can be really helpful. And then we also have a link here to um, some uh, useful meditations that you can do. Um, we developed them for, for autistic people, but I think they're useful for a lot of different people. And there's also some really easy videos and things you can watch that help you do some short exercises that help you be aware of what's going on in your body and in your breath uh, and in your heart um, that can help you sometimes to feel a little bit calmer. So um, yeah, so we'll make sure for everybody, I'm going to show you at the end how to reach out to me and also uh, we can work with um, the Canadian Down Syndrome Society around sharing these resources. They're all um, ways to, to access them for free. Okay. Um, so next slide. Hold on. There we go. So this is just showing you from the books that I mentioned, the self-help booklets. This is showing you part of what's in the book about anxiety. So you see here that there's different kinds of things we might feel in our body. And you would check off in the book, which of these kinds of feelings happen to you sometimes. And then it kind of shows where in your body you might have those feelings. So some people, when they're anxious, they feel it. In, I feel it in my stomach. Sometimes I feel it in my heart when my heart races. Um, some people have like a shaky leg. Um, some people feel like they're getting very sweaty. So this kind of shows you where you might be feeling the anxiety. And then this man is asking himself questions because it's during COVID. He says, what if I get sick? What if I forget to wash my hands? Will I ever see my friends again? So these are kinds of the nervous, anxious questions that are going through his head and they're going through his head really quickly and that's making him really anxious. So this is just an illustration in the book that talks about a way you can try to relax a little bit with your body and different things you can do sometimes to maybe distract yourself or take your mind off some of the things that worry you. Okay, remember I talked about um, lived experience, different kinds of difficult life events. Um, this is a website I really like. Uh, it's not a very fun website. It's called Breaking Bad News. But the truth is, and everybody here I'm guessing can relate to this, 
there's been bad news this pandemic, right? There have been things that have made people feel really upset. Um, and it's important to know how do we talk to people of um, disabilities about things that might be upsetting to them. So it could be about somebody dying or somebody sick or not being able to do something that you really like. And there's really good strategies or ideas in here about how we talk about these things. Because I think sometimes we think, well, I don't want to upset people, so I'm not going to talk about this because then they won't get upset. But the truth is they probably are already upset. And um, people with disabilities have told um, us, and this is in different countries, uh, people have asked the same question. And they said, you know what? We do want to talk about it and we like knowing what's going on. So again, this isn't for every single person. Some people might be a bit different, but overall it is really important for us to be able to think about ways to talk about things um, in a way that makes sense to that person to help them deal with things that make them sad or upset. So this is just a slide. Some people have had a hard time during COVID and it doesn't matter if you do or if you don't have a disability. But one of the things we do, I talked about different kinds of therapies, talking, books that are useful. Sometimes a medication is also helpful, but I just wanna um, mention four things to keep in mind about when you take a medication if you're having a hard time. One is, we always need to remember that H that I spoke about before. So we don't wanna treat something that is medical or that's about our health with a medication for a mental health problem. So make sure there's no constipation, hearing issues, dental pain, anything like that first. Um, keep in mind that if we're giving someone a medication to help them with their behavior, because they're having a really hard time, the medication may not work for a long time. It may just be something we do in the short time to make things easier and figure out what's going on. Some people get medications and the doctor says, this is a PRN medication, which means that you take it when you need it. So you might take it when you're having a lot of anxiety, you're getting really agitated. So maybe it's once a month, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's sometimes to help you sleep. If you notice that you're taking that kind of medication every day, it's not really what we call a PRN medication anymore. And you wanna to talk to your doctor about that because there might be a better medication to take every day than that medication that you're taking if you're taking it a lot. And the other thing that's important is medications do have side effects. And sometimes maybe it's not the right medication, but we still wanna be really careful not to just stop taking medications altogether like that. Because what can happen if you stop taking a medication without talking to your pharmacist and your doctor about it, is you can have side effects of withdrawal when the medication comes out of your body that can be really hard to handle. So it's really important to work. The same as when you start a new medication, you start by taking a very little bit and when your body adjusts, you maybe take a bit more, a bit more. When you go off a of medication, it's the same thing. You wanna make sure that you're carefully reducing the amount of medication gradually. And the doctor really wants to help you with that. You shouldn't do that on your own. This is just an example of different kinds of tools that you can use. And again, I'll show some of these links after that help you look at things like um, how the medications are working and if the things we're trying to treat with the medication are making a difference by taking the medication. Uh, and one of the things that medications affect in good and bad ways is it affects your sleep. So I'd say it's really important to monitor what's happening with your sleep. Are you waking up more in the night? Are you not waking up at night and having a better sleep? Are you sleeping so heavily that you don't wake up in the morning when it's time or you're falling asleep during the day? So tracking your sleep is really important. And this is the example of a sleep tracking record. Um, there's a toolkit here that's mentioned called the Family Matters Toolkit, and I'll put the link in for that for everybody. And it's got all the stuff I've been talking about is right there, and you can just click on it and download things. Okay, I have two lessons left, and then we'll have some time for some comments and questions. So lesson number four is giving yourself permission. Um, I think this is really important, and I have to say this is something I remind myself of regularly because I'm very good at telling you to give yourself permission, but I'm not always very good at giving myself permission. So giving myself permission really is about recognizing the things that are hard and maybe doing a bit less of it or giving myself permission if a lot of things are hard to do that much. So I'd like us to take a moment now, we can all do this activity. You can use the chat box or you can just do this on your own with a pen and paper. I want you to see, this is a tree, all the trees are gonna look like this soon when those gorgeous fall leaves um, fall off of them. 
think about those leaves falling to the ground and think about the things in your life that just zap you, that drain you of your energy and make the leaves fall off of your branches. What are those things going on that deplete you? And just write a little list for yourself. Take a few moments and do that. Okay, you might still be writing things down, um, or you might have some ideas from other people if they want to share what they've written, but you don't have to share uh, what you've written in the chat box, but if you want to, you can. I'm going to show you an image here, and some of you may even remember this image, because this is actually a photo I took when I was in Banff um, at the Arts Centre for the Canadian Down Syndrome Society conference that happened a couple of years back. So some of these you can see on your screen. So no sleep at all, being hurt. Um, when we feel lonely or sad, um, don't tell me what to do, stressed out, getting bullied, sad. Um, so um, when I don't get enough sleep. So lots of different examples. And these are the leaves falling to the, to the ground that, um, that uh, a group of adults from uh, the CDSS wrote about for themselves as things that deplete them or zap them of their energy. So I want you to notice for yourself, if you wrote any of those things down, how many things did you write? How many of those things are going on for you right now? Is there one thing that zaps you of your energy that depletes you that you can take off of your list? Um, are there more things on that list than you kind of thought there were? If you're doing this activity with somebody else, do you have the same number of things on your list? Just kind of look at all the stuff going on right now that is depleting you, okay? That's all I want you to do. Now we're going to do another activity. Uh, oh, no, before we get to that, uh, I have a, I forgot about these slides. This is, this is, the, this is my, my little um, segue on the story of bad news and the side effects of bad news. So this is an article that came out um, in September, actually. Uh, so it was a fancy article in a fancy journal. And it was an article about how people did after they got vaccinated in the UK. So after they wrote that article, headlines started to come out. And in fact, um, one of the families from here sent me the first headline. That's how I found out about the article. Uh, and it was in The Guardian, people with chronic conditions among most at risk from COVID even after jabs. And research finds those with Down syndrome, Parkinson's and other conditions may benefit from a booster dose. And then if you read that article, it talked about how the group at the greatest risk post-vaccination of getting COVID and having something really bad happening, including mortality, were people with Down syndrome. And then you can see this other study on the bottom with this really awful looking picture. And the headline is study among vaccinated those with Down syndrome face highest risk from COVID. That is another bad news story. On top of so many bad news stories, everybody's been hearing across this whole pandemic. And I have to tell you, I think when families were seeing this story, and I don't know if anyone remembers seeing this story, if you did, you're welcome to put something in the chat box. I was working with one of my friends, uh, colleagues who understands this kind of research uh, and who also has a family member with Down syndrome. And we were just trying to figure out what the heck the study meant and how it could be that after being vaccinated, people could get so sick and what that would mean. And we realized when we started to really unpack what that study was saying, it wasn't actually saying what the headlines were saying. Okay, but one thing that happened I was having a conversation, in fact, and, and Sue said I could point, point it out to her. The numbers aren't as bad as they sound, blah, 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 blah. And I think Sue just felt a little bit depleted because there's just been so much news upon bad news upon bad news. And it made me really think about how it feels to keep sort of getting this media information about stuff that is bad when so many things are going on and you've had so many bad news things to hear already. So two things happened in response to that. One is, and if you like reading sort of academic articles, a really nice response to that article was published by the um, Trisomy 21 uh, International Research Group. Um, and it really outlined what some of the problems were with the study and with how it explained things or didn't explain things when it comes to Down syndrome. And then I also 
try to think about um, what some of the side effects might be of hearing so much bad news. And so I can share the blog that I wrote about that and some of the thoughts I had after listening to what it was like for people who were really affected by these kinds of headlines. So anyways, the point of that, I think, is that a lot of things deplete us, but even the news and just the day-to-day -day of what's going on right now can be very depleting. So I want you to switch for a moment and think about the things that nourish you or that strengthen you and try to write some of those things down. So these are the things you may be able to do them all the time, maybe things you don't get to do right now, but think about those things in your life that help you grow like this plant that's gonna blossom into a big tree. And the first thing I want you to look at is how did you do with the two lists of the depleting and the nourishing activities? Here's some beautiful nourishing flowers that uh, folks put uh, on their big tree that was like on the window, out looking at the, the, the mountains in Banff. It was probably the most spectacular view I've ever seen, but things that nurtured or strengthened people, dancing, going to the movies with friends, gardening, going to school, travel, visiting my niece, listening to music, taking a cold shower, I don't like that, but some people do drinking some water. Now, one of the important things here is that some of those activities that nourish or strengthen people with Down syndrome are things that they aren't allowed to do or they weren't allowed to do during the pandemic. And the same thing might be going on for you right now, that maybe some of the things that do strengthen you are things that are harder to do. And the things that do deplete you are things you can't necessarily stop having happen. It's still really important to do this kind of exercise because, you know, in a perfect world, we can try to have more of these flowers. We can try to do more of the things that nurture us and fewer of the things that deplete us. But sometimes it's not in our control and we can't actually change those things around. So I think knowing that for yourself, knowing is there anything more I can do on the nurturing side and anything I can get rid of on the depleting side is good. But if you can't make those changes right now, you can give yourself permission to just not expect so much of yourself in that time. You can tell people, I need a bit of extra help right now because there's just too much going on, too much depletion. I can't do that commitment I made. I need someone else to cook dinner. Um, I just, we're not going to do the most interesting things this weekend. Sorry, I know that's bad news, but that's really all I can manage. So it's just kind of giving yourself permission to do what you can, but recognize that you can't do everything because it's a hard time. And I've come to my last lesson, which is a really important one. I um, mean, it's that as a community, I really think we can make a difference. If there's something I've learned that's positive during this pandemic, it's how people can come together, you know? So whether it's about um, just dealing with how we all, you know, may do with all the closures and and not having information and being afraid at the beginning of the pandemic, or the remarkable advocacy that got vaccines to all of us in our communities when we needed them. Like that wasn't done just because the government said, of course we'll do that, it's very important. That was done because as a community, people came together. You know, I, I have to say, I'm not a big uh, Down syndrome researcher uh, at all, um, but I never had so many media interviews as I did uh, in the last year around how COVID was impacting people with Down syndrome and trying to understand some of the literature and the research on vaccinations. And the reason why all those people were doing all those news stories was not just because of the research, it was because of families and people speaking up and speaking out and coming together. One of the campaigns that I'm so proud of that I was involved with was Ready for My Shot, which is still going on. And that was started by a Down syndrome family who said, hey, we got to get people aware of what is going on here. We have to come together on this. And Canadian Down Syndrome Society did some tremendous advocacy as well. Um, and together, in fact, with that other group, there are a number of groups that came together um, to really make a difference. And um, this is one of my favorite quotes. I think I've been saying it for a very long time and maybe many of you know it, but never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think even though we're living far apart from each other, we're not seeing each other sometimes when we're trying to keep ourselves safe and we're fairly isolated in our own homes. We're still together on this and we're still supporting each other. We're exchanging information with each other. We're holding each other up and we're pushing for change. And I think that kind of community of us working together 
is powerful. It's like a healing salve that I think helps us and will keep helping us to get through what's gonna happen in the next coming months. Um, we do need to keep in mind some of the emerging concerns or things that are still going on. So just to highlight here, um, there's a sort of a visual of the ready for my shot sort of campaign part two, which is making sure there's still a small group of people who haven't been vaccinated in Ontario. Uh, it's under 20% of adults with developmental disabilities, um, but it's still about one in five people who haven't had that vaccine for different reasons. Uh, and there's more we can do to support them and help them. There's ways we can make vaccines more accessible. We also need to make sure that even if people who have been vaccinated, that rapid tests are available, that we make sure these vaccine passports we're rolling out are accessible for people, and that we make sure our whole community is careful and safe in what they're doing to keep people with Down syndrome and their families safe. We also need to be ready if people have to go to the hospital at this time that they're prepared to do so. And this is an example of a form that helps people if they go to the hospital to know what some of their needs are to make sure they get the best care. Uh, and we need to think about how people are catching up with healthcare needs that have been ignored um, and making sure that people are staying healthy uh, in this time. So again, I think as a community, we can flag or identify what some of the problems are that people are ha having, and we can come together to try to make a difference. So that's the end of my formal talk. I've left some time for questions and comments. Um, and um, that's my contact info. And I can also put it in the chat box and take down this picture or the screen so we can talk together as a group. And I see a question that's coming from Helen and Stefan and Paul. If people with Down syndrome are generally experiencing more mental health repercussions from COVID than other populations, if yes, what do you see happening? Um, so my answer to this is that people with development disabilities have also experienced, always experienced more mental health um, issues or problems or challenges than other people. So I don't think that's any different during the pandemic. Um, I think in terms of more mental health repercussions, like so things that are happening that are worse because of the pandemic for this group. Um, I think some of that research is still, um, I know we've looked at it actually just for Ontario, where we've looked at kind of the types of mental health services access. So going to the emergency department for a mental health problem or being hospitalized for a mental health problem for people with a developmental disability. And we looked at what happened um, the first year after COVID started from the year before, kind of comparing it for people with developmental disabilities. And we didn't see a big change in those two years. Um, we saw maybe a little bit less um, hospitalizations and emergency department visits for mental health. But compared to people without developmental disabilities, where very few of the times they go to the hospital is for a mental health issue, it's much more so for people with developmental disabilities. We didn't look at it separately for Down syndrome, um, but I know there's some studies and some research that's going on now through that um, international research group that I talked about, looking at the sort of mental health impacts of COVID on people with Down syndrome. And there's a survey that families can fill out. Um, and then we can look at that information more consistently. We're, we're looking a little bit at it in some of the data that we have uh, from Canada, and, um, but we, don't, we haven't summarized those results yet. I think one thing that's important, Helen, is that um, the kind of mental health problems people had a year and a half ago are different than what we're seeing now, right? Like it was like the shock, like, oh my gosh, what is happening? How can this be happening? That's a certain kind of mental health problem, right? What do you mean I can't do this thing anymore? But what's happening now is like for so long, not doing a lot of stuff makes us start to think and act differently. And it makes other things harder. And I think especially when people have experienced loss and grief, about just the world kind of changing and feeling out of control, over time that can bring on different kinds of problems. And I think one thing that's tricky, if you have Down syndrome, it might be harder for you to talk about some of those things. Um, and also sometimes you don't know, is this aging? Is this Down syndrome? Is this depression? So it's harder to figure out what the thing is that's making things look different right now, which is why some of the things I spoke about around knowing kind of your normal or what your everyday is and being able to articulate those changes is so important when you're talking to healthcare providers. So Cecilia had a question about any recommendations for supporting people who might be having a hard time returning to their usual community activities. Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, I'll see also if I can share after a link too. We did uh, a chat, I work with the family doctor, Yolanda Neal, and we did a video sort of talking about some of these things together and we are talking about some of these ideas. Um, so I can share that with you as well. We're just, we've never been in this situation before, 
right? We've had a situation where one person wasn't doing their activities for a long time and now they're returning to their activities, but we've never been in a world situation where everybody has stopped doing their activities and everyone is returning. So we're only learning about this as we go. I think my advice is that um, just because the return to the usual activity is like a good thing, doesn't mean it's an easy thing, right? And I think you could probably relate to that yourself. I know I'm allowed to go into work regularly, daily, if I want to now. And it just feels weird. You know, like, I don't really want to, first of all, I don't have clothes that fit me the same way they used to before, but I don't really know how to interact with people on the bus. I don't know how to socialize with people. I don't want to be at work that much. So I think that's happening to all of us. And I think kind of remembering that when your loved one who has a disability, if you don't have a disability yourself is going through that might help them a bit. Um, so even good changes are hard changes. And, and we're also not the same people we were 18 months ago, right? So I think having that appreciation makes a bit of a difference and trying to set yourself up for a bit of success, right? So thinking about like, what's a small step we can try um, instead of a big step that's going to feel like a fail? Because once we've had a big fail, we're never doing that again, right? So is there something little we can do that will be successful, that we plan together, that we're proud of, that we celebrate? And then gradually we can make those things bigger and then we can kind of adjust as we need to. Maybe this was too much. Maybe this is too much of a change. Let's try something smaller next time, right? And also kind of recognizing or acknowledging that sometimes something is hard or we don't enjoy it as much as we used to. But maybe if we try it a couple of times, we might enjoy it a little bit more. You know, and again, I think we can all relate to that. So um, being willing to try something like an experiment, not because it's going to be so great, but because sometimes we like to try things. Remember when we had to try Zoom for the first time for a meeting, nobody wanted to do that. And now look at us, right? We're all doing a great job with it. Look at everybody here. Although I haven't seen a lot of emoticons floating through the, can I, can I get an emoticon? Can someone give me a, a little uh, reaction, a Zoom reaction? We've gotten better. There we go, some thumbs up, a bit of a heart. So we've gotten better at things, right? So we can do experiments. We can try something. It doesn't have to be perfect. We can learn from it. And then maybe when we try it next time, it'll be a little bit easier. So other questions from people. And just to say, well, you're thinking about those questions, but you can also turn off your mic and you can just say a question. You yeah, know. I was just gonna I was just gonna say that. Deborah, it looks like you might have something. Are you are you looking to ask a question? Yes, actually I am. Oh. And I have not been on Zoom for a while, can you tell? <laughs> um I was wanting to ask a question about do we know anything more about um boosters for individuals with down syndrome isn't that the biggest question it's you know i hate to say day. that uh, <laughs> you know and I'm, i am following this really closely as somebody who you know didn't really think about these things ever at all and it's become like a big part of mm -hmm. what i do um we know that um the cdc has recommended boosters for people with down syndrome we know that um the sort of vaccination committee um, from the UK recommended that as early as the summer. We know that um, the national advisory around immunizations in Canada has not recommended that yet in a way that's uh, easy for us to interpret. Um, and we also know that what happens with each province is based on each province and not based on national guidance. It would have been helpful, I think, if the national guidance had put that down on paper to get the provinces and territories to adopt it. Um, one thing to keep in mind, well, two things that I'm going to say that maybe will help you feel a little bit calmer, at least for this little bit of time. One is that the research we're looking at that talks about how people manage uh, with the vaccine and sort of waning immunity and that kind of thing. First of all, some of the research is based on places like in the US, they had a month between their two vaccines. Whereas here, most of the people with Down syndrome and ourselves had at least two months. And that longer period of time between vaccines has actually helped us in terms of our immunity. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is that the people who are getting their third shot right now, many of them had their first vaccine earlier than we did, which sucked at the time because we all would have liked to have been vaccinated sooner 
But what it means is we have a little bit longer of a window because we didn't get our second vaccine for most people until at least June and probably July or August. It does mean that we want to start having, you know, that third vaccine um, sometime in the new year and every month we'll get a little more anxious about it. But my sense is that things will start to roll out and there's still an appreciation of groups who are more vulnerable before the entire population. Um, so I know I saw today actually just the news, there was an announcement in BC about vaccinations and they said yes. they're again, starting with the sort of vulnerable oldest adults, but they said that within eight months a vaccination would be the more general population is what I kind of read in that news thing on Twitter. So, I mean, we'll see what comes out of BC and I, Sue's looking at this and thinking about it. So I think it's gonna come, but I don't think we can, if I've learned another lesson, I don't think we can be complacent and just sit back and say, oh, we know they'll remember us because they learned last time. So we do have to continue to advocate and remind people, Hill Down Syndrome or Trisomy 21 Research Society, um, very shortly, making that recommendation again. Uh, yeah, I guess that was, research, that was the so question. we already have Canadian. The question yeah, is, is there a we... Go ahead, Deborah, sorry. Sorry, I, I just had wondered whether um, CVSS or yourselves had been in touch with the either the federal government or Ontario um, as to making sure they don't forget us again. <laughs> so I, I'm from Ontario. I realized not everyone here is from Ontario. I've been um, doing my, my work that I can in terms of communicating the science and reasons for groups that need to be remembered most quickly. Uh, which would include people with Down syndrome. Um, so I think that there is an awareness of that um, and it's on the table um, recognizing vulnerability. I think there's some commitments, uh, but I don't want to be quoted on what day it's going to come out, right? Um, I think at the national level, I think it is important to look at the advocacy that CDSS is doing and trying to align it with some of the evidence and some of the documents that are coming out, including the document that will come out about Down syndrome through the um, research organization that I mentioned, and also citing the CDC, the JCVI, I think those things help, um, and just continuing to share the message. But in terms of the panic mode, I don't think we need to be in panic mode yet, um, uh, but we do need to keep people aware you know, of what we know. But just trying to separate again, the issue of being at greater risk if you get sick from COVID, from not having the immunity right now from the vaccine. And I don't think, we know that people with Down syndrome are not immune right now. In fact, I know in Ontario, we're monitoring how people are doing in terms of breakthrough infections, including people with developmental disabilities. We have very low, low cases of infections where people are getting very sick. Um, and also in that study from the UK that I showed you, where it looked like maybe things are really terrible for people with, really, with Down syndrome. If you take that study apart and they didn't have the same vaccines we've had, you know, thousands, there were almost 4,000 adults with Down syndrome in that study. And it looked like maybe under four of them, if any at all out of the 4,000 um, were hospitalized or died related to maybe getting only one of the two vaccines, right? So they didn't even give them both vaccines or both vaccines over a period of time. And really there was hardly anything um, that happened in terms of bad outcomes. It may have been zero people. They didn't actually give the number, but the number was so low they couldn't report a number. So I think that tells us that so far people are doing okay and we have a bit of time, if that's helpful. Mm. We, um, you know, in your question about CDSS continuing to, uh, to advocate, yes, 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 and yes. You know, we do get questions uh, quite often from individual families who are in sort of this panic mode because they've read some of these recent studies and or media interpretations of them. And it's what, as uh, Yona said, what the headline says is not really what the, what the study says. But of course, somebody who doesn't take the time or can understand the way the study's written, we'll only look at the headline and get very anxious about it. And you know, we would encourage that Macy is aware, they've heard about us, they know about us, they know what's happened in the States, they know what's happening, research is coming, but we just don't know. But there are certain comfort and perhaps safety measures that Yona's outlined in. And it's not as urgent tomorrow as um, some of the news reports make make you think that it is 
Yeah, and keeping in mind, we really do want to make sure that the people who got vaccinated well before people with Down syndrome the first time and didn't get the two months in between, that they should be prioritized for the vaccine next, right? And that's why they're getting vaccinated right now. But we're ready. And as I can see from Sue's posting as well, ready for my shot, which we should all follow is sort of keeping their eye. And we'll probably switch from advocating around helping those people who haven't been able to get vaccinated to get vaccinated to thinking about this kind of booster advocacy uh, when we when it needs to start. You know, I would say certainly if we still haven't heard anything at all and we're in the middle of December, then we can make some more noise again because we don't want to be in the same situation next year that we were in a year ago. I really don't want to ever talk to the media again about vaccines. I would love never <laughs> even have to mention the word vaccines ever again. So. I'm sure you can way. It is a bit after eight o'clock. I don't mind staying on a little bit longer if there's more questions, but I realize some people might want to go back to the other things they're doing in their lives. There is um, a question from Jennifer Croson. Are you planning okay. any research that is specific to the Down syndrome community, given all this is very interesting and important work you've been doing during COVID? Right. Yeah. So we're, we're always doing... Uh, um, research, the best way you can learn about what we're doing is to um, follow HCARD or email us at the HCARD email address there. Some of the research we do, what we try to do, so for example, we're studying right now what the needs of people with development disabilities and families are, and we have a survey that I can share with CDSS. It's not a Down syndrome survey, but we always would ask if somebody has Down syndrome so that we can then look at that subgroup separately. So in some of the projects and things we've been doing, you know, once we have enough people in that subgroup of people with Down syndrome, we can start to look at what's going on for them specifically. Um, we also um, do different kinds of mental health interventions and th things like that. So if that's kind of of interest, so even some of the caregiver stuff that I spoke about, um, you know, if it's of interest for families in the Down syndrome community to connect with other Down syndrome families and do some of the caregiver mental health related stuff, it's certainly something um, that we could look at doing. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't don't have any studies sort of funded right now that are specifically on Down syndrome, but always always keen to hear what people are interested in. Um, you know, I think it's important. Research is really important. So go ahead. Jennifer. Sorry, Yona, you said H, H card. What was that? You said we should follow. Card. Right. So it's H card. I realize my slide is not on your screen anymore. I'm looking at I have a split okay. screen. So I'm looking at it's an it's an anagram about. Okay. It's, All right. it's okay. an anagram, and uh, we can certainly provide the link to HCARD. Okay. We have HCARD resources on our scattered through on your, our, web, our website. Yeah. Okay. All right. I yeah, just okay. I didn't hear it properly. Card. Now I see it. Okay. Thank you. I just didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Hear it Stands for the Healthcare Access Research and Developmental Disabilities Program, and then we have a specific page that's just about COVID resources, and a lot of the stuff I showed today is right on that page. So any other questions or closing thoughts? Well, Yona, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the uh, Canadian Down Syndrome Society, we'd like to thank you for speaking this evening and sharing your reflection on the work that you have been doing, but also on the connections that you have um, with international work. We're very pleased to have you as our ally, and we look forward to a continuing relationship and being able to, to um, seek information from you or certainly from others that you might be connected with. So again, thank you so much. And uh, that was a great introduction to our webinar series on um, mental health and well-being. Thank you, Yona. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And uh, I think the next two webinars webinars are going to be awesome. I'm really excited about them. So thanks, everybody. And please reach out to me if you have more questions. Take care. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you.